It's now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Raj Shetty, our keynote speaker. Dr. Shetty is an Indian-born American economist and the William A. Aikman Professor of Public Economics at Harvard University. Some of Dr. Shetty's recent papers have studied equality of opportunity in the United States and other places in the states in general. He was offered tenure at the age of 28 and became one of the youngest tenured faculty in the history of Harvard's economics department. His full bio is in the digital program if you want to see more about him. Following Dr. Shetty's presentation, Dr. Mickey Canones, Dean of the Robbins School of Business at the University of Richmond, will be joining Dr. Shetty on stage for a deeper conversation and a, in a, an audience Q&A following that. Please join me in giving Dr. Shetty a warm RVA welcome. Thanks so much, everyone. It's uh, really a pleasure to be here in Richmond with all of you this morning discussing these critical issues. So I'm gonna talk about how we can all take steps in our local communities and our local institutions here in Richmond to increase economic opportunity. But I wanna start at a much bigger picture level by talking about the American dream, which is of course a multifaceted, complicated concept that can mean different things to different people. But I wanna start in this first chart here by distilling it to a simple statistic that we can measure systematically in the data, which is the chance that a child goes on to have a higher standard of living than their parents did. So as you all know, one of the cornerstone aspects of the American dream is the idea that we aspire to be a country where through hard work, any child can go on to have a higher standard of living than their parents. And so here in this first chart, uh, I'm drawing from a study my colleagues and I did a few years ago where we set about to assess whether America actually lives up to that aspiration. And what we did is calculated the fraction of kids who go on to earn more than their parents, measuring both kids' and parents' incomes in their mid-30s and adjusting for inflation. And we look at that data by the year in which the child was born, starting on the far left with kids born in the 1940s and going all the way on the far right to kids born in the 1980s who are turning 30 around now when we're measuring their incomes. And what you can see here is that for kids born in the middle of the last century, it was a virtual guarantee that you were gonna achieve the American dream of moving up. 92% of children born in 1940 in America, by our estimates, went on to earn more than their parents did. But if you look at what has happened over time, you see a dramatic fading of the American dream, such that for children born uh, in recent decades, it's essentially become a coin flip, a 50-50 shot as to whether you're gonna do better than your parents. So this dramatic trend is of course of great interest to economists like myself, but because it reflects a fundamental change in the American economy that we'd like to understand. But I would argue it's also a fundamental social and political interest, because I think it's this very trend that underlies why a lot of people, many people around the United States are expressing frustration that this is no longer a country where it's easy to get ahead, and that's reflected in political outcomes and so forth. So motivated by this trend, in our research and policy group at Harvard Opportunity Insights, we're focused on that very big picture question of what is causing the fading of the American dream and how can we restore the American dream going forward, giving kids from all backgrounds better chances of rising up. So we are by no means the only ones or the first ones to be studying these questions. There's a long history of discussion in the social sciences and policy circles about inequality, about opportunity, about how to help people do better. What is our angle on these age-old issues? Uh, our focus is using the tools of modern big data to study how to increase upward mobility. So you all hear a lot nowadays about the use of large data sets in the private sector to improve products. Think of companies like Amazon and Google that are using large data sets to optimize the products they offer. Analogously, our vision is that these kinds of data sets can offer us new insight into key economic and social policy questions. And that's what I hope to illustrate to you today. Now, when you're working with these large data sets that I'm gonna talk about in a second, you have to have an angle through which you're gonna analyze that data. Often, when people are talking about things like inequality, they will focus on one particular topic area. Like, it would be very natural to focus on education as a potential lever to increase economic opportunity. And I am gonna talk about education and its quite important role. But what I will show you is that there are a wide variety of other factors that seem to matter as well, from education to housing to social capital and so on. 
And so rather than focusing on one particular topic, I'm gonna to organize things from a life course perspective, analyzing a broad range of interventions from childhood to adulthood. The starting point for a lot of our work and what I'm gonna talk with you all about today is that there are very sharp local differences in rates of upward mobility. So that national picture that I started out with turns out to hide a lot of variation across different parts of the country, across different cities, and so forth. And so to turn to that, <clears throat> I'm gonna jump into the data by showing you this map here. Let me first describe how we construct this map and then tell you what I think we learned from it. So this map is showing you the geography of upward mobility in America. What we do is take data from anonymized tax returns covering all Americans, and in particular, focus on 20 million kids, essentially all kids born in the early 1980s in America. We link those kids back to their parents and back to the area in which they grew up and classify them into 740 uh, different metro and rural areas uh, where they were born. And in each of those areas, we compute a very simple measure of upward mobility using income information from tax returns. We ask, what is the average income at age 35 for kids who grew up in low-income families, families at the 25th percentile of the national income distribution, which corresponds to a household income of about $27,000 a year? So just to be clear, I'm gonna show you a bunch of maps like this, so I wanna make sure uh, this is very clear. We're taking a bunch of kids who start out, all start out in families making about 27,000 a year. They're growing up in different parts of America. We're gonna track them over time using the tax data and ask how much are they earning as adults no matter where they're living at that point. We color the map so that blue-green colors represent areas with higher levels of upward mobility and red-orange colors represent areas with lower levels of upward mobility. If you start by looking at the scale in the lower right-hand side of this chart, you can see that there's an enormous amount of variation, even for kids in the current generation born in the 1980s, in your shot of kind of achieving the American dream of moving up across different parts of America. There's some parts of the country, like the rural Midwest, for example, take a place like Dubuque, Iowa, kids starting out in families making $27,000 a year, one generation later, on average, are making 45 or even $50,000 a year in parts of the Midwest. So that's a lot of upward mobility on average across one generation. In contrast, you have many other cities and parts of the US like much of the Southeast, cities like Charlotte, cities like Richmond, which I'm gonna, of course gonna focus on in detail, where uh, kids starting out in families at the exact same income level, 27,000, one generation later, are actually not doing that much better than their parents, in some cases, even doing wor worse than their parents on average. And that is, I think, incredibly maybe distressing and surprising given the tremendous amount of economic growth that has happened over the past 30 years in America in general and in many cities like Charlotte, like Richmond, and so on. So when you look at this map, I think there are two things that are important to take away. First, you know, people often ask me, do you think the American dream is alive or not? And what this map shows you is the answer to that question really depends upon which part of America you're talking about. There's no single answer to that question. There are places in America where the American dream is well and alive. There are places in America where it's really not a, a reality. And so that fact itself is useful to understand for policy because it suggests that taking a place-focused approach where we focus on bringing opportunity to the places where it's lacking can be very valuable. The second thing uh, that is valuable, valuable about this map and what has really been very useful from a research perspective from our lens at Harvard is that this kind of gives you a new tool to study the determinants of economic opportunity that we never had before. Think of it as like having a microscope for the first time, which of course was uh, fundamental for biology. Similarly in economics, being able to break down the data in this way is incredibly useful because now we can start to ask, you know, what is it that's systematically different about places like Dubuque, about places like Salt Lake City, relative to places like Cincinnati or Cleveland or the Southeast? What are the factors, what are the determinants of economic mobility and how might we change those going forward to bring opportunity everywhere? So motivated by that line of reasoning, what I'm gonna do in the next few minutes is walk through a series of hypotheses that we might have for what drives the variation that we're seeing in this map. You might already have some explanations in your own mind. And we're gonna just systematically test what seems to be important in, in driving this variation. 
And once we do that academic or scientific exercise of understanding the determinants of economic mobility, I'm then in the last part of the talk going to talk about how for an audience like this, you can take that kind of information and use it to actually make changes on the ground in terms of policies, in terms of what companies are doing, what local institutions are doing to increase economic opportunity. So let's start with what often comes to my, the mind of economists as the first potential hypothesis or folks in the, in the business sector, that maybe this is about differences in the types of jobs available in different areas. So take an example like the Bay Area, Silicon Valley, we know the tech sector has been doing really well in the past 30 years. Maybe that's why kids who grow up in that area tend to have pretty good uh, rates of upward mobility. So that, that's a perfectly plausible starting explanation. Let's evaluate that by plotting rates of upward mobility for the kids who grew up in low-income families, so the data that I showed you on the map a second ago, for the 30 largest metro areas here, as well as Richmond, highlighted in red, um, that's what's plotted on the vertical axis. And let's plot that against job growth rates from 1990 to 2010, the period when kids in this sample I'm looking at were growing up. And what you can see here is this basically looks like a cloud. There's not much of a relationship between these two things. In particular, you have cities like Charlotte and Atlanta, which you all probably know are some of the most rapidly growing cities in America. If you look at any conventional measure, like the number of jobs, high paying jobs, wages, and so on, if you just drove around those cities, you would see they look very different today than they did 30 years ago. Yet despite that, you can see, you know, we picked the example of Charlotte. Charlotte ranks as the 50th among the 50 largest cities in America in terms of rates of upward mobility for the kids who grow up there in low-income families. So when we use this longitudinal data following kids over time who grew up in Charlotte, we see that they're not really benefiting from the tremendous amount of growth that's happening in Charlotte. So you might ask, you know, wait, first of all, how does that even add up? How can it be that average incomes are going up in Charlotte, but the kids who are growing up there are not actually experiencing upward mobility? The way I think about it is a lot of cities like Charlotte end up basically importing talent there are people who grew up in other places who moved to Charlotte to get high paying jobs at firms like Bank of America, which is headquartered in Charlotte. But apparently what we see in these new data where we're able to follow people over time, that doesn't automatically translate to better outcomes for the kids growing up in your city. So a simple point, but I think a very important one for folks in business, you know, obviously jobs matter in the grand scheme of things. People need to have good jobs in order to be able to move up but simply trying to get the next you know, big company's headquarters to move to your city or simply have you know, better jobs in your area is not in and of itself a guarantee that you're gonna have better outcomes in your community. What these data suggest is you really need to focus on the development of skills of the people in the local community in order to be able to get those high paying jobs uh, at firms that are offering them. Okay, so that was hypothesis number one. Maybe it's about the jobs that itself, in and of itself is, is not the answer. So let's go back to the map and consider a different explanation. Anyone familiar with the demography of the US would recognize that there's a potential connection to race here, and that will of course be uh, very resonant here, here in Richmond, uh, where we see that places with larger African-American populations like the Southeast, like Cincinnati, Cleveland, you know, Richmond and so forth, tend to be the places in the red and orange colors on the map. Now, we all know that there's a long history of racial disparities and discrimination that goes back a long time uh, in the US. And so maybe part of the differences that we're seeing in this map are differences by race rather than differences by place. So in order to get at that, what we did next is linked the information from the tax records to census data, which gives us information on race and ethnicity for everyone in the US. And that allows us to construct this pair of maps here, which is showing you the exact same statistics that I was talking about before on rates of upward mobility, but separately now for black men on the left and white men on the right. Now, when you initially look at this pair of maps, you know, many people react by saying, oh, it looks like they've put these maps on two different color scales, kind of a red-orange color scale on the left and a blue-green color scale on the right. But in fact, if you look at the bottom of the slide, you can see that we have not done that. The maps are on the same color scale. It is just that there's such an extreme difference in rates of upward mobility for black men and white men in America that it's almost like, like you're living in two different countries. 
Put it a bit more precisely, the very best places for upward mobility for black men, a place like Boston, for example, where a black man growing up in a low-income family can go on to expect to earn about $25,000 a year, they have lower levels of upward mobility than the lowest ranking places in terms of upward mobility for white men, places like Charlotte, North Carolina, uh, for example. And so uh, what we um, see, and I apologize that the, the map slightly cut off on the right there, but you know, you see that very clearly in Richmond uh, as well, where black men in Richmond go on to have average earnings of about $18,000 a year if they're growing up in a low-income family, compared with that number is 28,000 for white men in Richmond. So an enormous disparity in outcomes by race. Now you'll notice here I focus specifically on men. Why did I do that? Let's now construct the same pair of maps for women. And you see a very different picture here, which is basically the same spectrum of colors in the map on the left for black women and the, the map on the right for white women. So what we're seeing here is that racial disparities in upward mobility interact with gender. They're completely driven by differences in outcomes for black versus white men. When we look at black versus white women growing up in families with comparable income, and that's important, we're thinking about kids starting out in families at the same income level, their chances of moving up don't look all that different. So that's really useful to know because when you think about the source of these racial disparities, thinking about the role of gender apparently is quite important. You might think about things like mass incarceration, discrimination that's particularly affecting men in the labor market and so forth. Whatever the underlying factor, and I don't think we fully know the answer yet, it's clear that there's a set of issues affecting black men in particular that are uh, limiting their economic opportunity. So what we've learned from this analysis is that race is undoubtedly very important, but even conditional on race, if you look at the map on the right, uh, and again, let me just call out the numbers for Richmond, you know, 23,000 for black women on, uh, in Richmond, 21,000 for white women in, in growing up in low-income families in Richmond. So it's actually black women growing up in low-income families are doing a little better than, than white women uh, in Richmond, which I think is striking and very different for, from what you see uh, for men. So, you know, race matters, but then even when you look within the map for white women, it's clear there's an enormous difference in outcomes across different places for white women. So race matters, but place matters even conditional on, on race. I want to make one final point on race before, before moving on to, to other factors, which is in most of what I'm going to focus on today, and I think usually what people think about, I'm going to talk about upward mobility, kids starting out in low-income families and their chances of rising up, which is what I think a lot of people are focused on, and rightly so. But especially in the context of race, I think it's equally important to think about the opposite direction of downward mobility. Think about kids starting out in high-income families and ask where they end up in the income distribution. And just to show you why that's so important, let me turn to this animation here, which was constructed by the New York Times using our data. So what we're doing here is tracking the lives of black men shown in the purple dots and white men shown in the green dots. And all of these kids started out in high income families in the top fifth of the income distribution. And we're asking, where did they themselves end up as adults? Do they end up staying in the top fifth or do they end up falling all the way down to the bottom fifth or are they somewhere in the middle? And what you can see is I think a really disturbing pattern, which is the purple dots have a tendency to cascade downward. If you start out as a high income black kid, you're almost as likely to end up at the bottom of the income distribution as you are to remain at the top. Whereas for white men, if you look at the green dots, they tend to float at the top of the chart. If you start out in a high income family, you tend to remain in the upper middle class as a white man. So th this is critical in understanding the persistence of racial disparities in America. If, if to think about it you know, in, in a more visual uh, way, if you imagine the American dream is climbing a ladder for white Americans, for black Americans, it's more like being on a treadmill where even after you climb up in one generation, there are apparently tremendous structural forces that have a tendency to push you back down in the next generation, only to have to make the climb again. So that's very important to recognize because even if we manage to improve outcomes for black kids starting out in low-income families at present, unless we fix this treadmill phenomenon, it's never going to stick. The problem is going to reemerge in subsequent generations. And so what this means from a policy point of view 
is when we think about race, you know, often what people are focused on is the most disadvantaged communities, the high schools with the least resources that have many black kids and so forth. But this shows you that even black kids who are coming from well-resourced families, who are in the best school districts and so on, have very different outcomes from white boys you know, growing up in comparable environments. And so we need to think hard about how to address racial disparities, even in the upper middle class, in order to make progress on race in America in general and Richmond in particular. Okay, so I've shown you a bunch of uh, facts about what might matter about economic opportunity, focusing mainly on national comparisons, you know, Richmond versus other cities and so on. And I think there's a lot you can learn from that. But to go deeper, I now wanna zoom in and look at the data at a finer grained level um, here, you know, within uh, Richmond. Um, and so the way I'm gonna do that is to toggle over to this tool called the Opportunity Atlas, the website you can freely access, opportunityatlas.org. And the way this website works is that you can type in an address, very much like a Google map. I'm gonna type in Calhoun Street here in Richmond, and we're literally gonna zoom in and look at the data, census tract by census tract here in uh, Richmond, okay? So the, the first thing to note, and you all are much more familiar with the geography of Richmond than I am, I'm just looking at this, you know, kind of what do I see in the data from the 30,000 foot level? So census tract by census tract, just to be clear on the unit of geography here. So these are small neighborhoods that have about 4,000 people each. We're constructing the exact same statistics on upward mobility that I've been showing you throughout at this very local level. The first very simple point to make is if you look at the spectrum of colors that you're seeing on this map, it's exactly the same spectrum of colors that I was showing you at the national level. So within Richmond, even though on average Richmond has lower levels of upward mobility, it's clear that even within Richmond, there are some places where kids who grew up in lower, relatively low income families have very good chances of rising up and there are other places where they are disastrously poor. Um, and so, you know, the simple takeaway from that is it's not that you have to look from the southeast to the northeast or you know, one state versus another state to understand why economic mobility is different. No, often, in, as you see here in Richmond and in cities across America, it's about going two miles down the street where you see completely different outcomes for kids growing up in low-income families there. And that, to me, is very encouraging because it suggests you know, we don't need to look back to the 1950s. We don't need to look to other countries for solutions uh, for increasing upward mobility, you can actually just look within your own city and find places that have much better outcomes, which suggests that this might be much more malleable as a problem uh, than you might otherwise think. So let's now dig into the data in a little bit more detail uh, here uh, within Richmond. So in this initial view that I'm showing you, I'm uh, pooling all races and ethnicities. Okay, so I just pointed out a second ago that there are very big differences by race. You all know that Richmond is incredibly segregated by race. So what we can do now with this tool is look at the data for specific subgroups. I'm gonna click on black folks here and zoom in uh, a little bit to just now, now we're looking at the data just for black people in Richmond, okay? Um, and what you can see is that while rates of economic mobility we've seen are much lower for black kids than for white kids, you can see that there are very sharp differences you know, across nearby areas. And I'm highlighting this one area that I'm sure you're all familiar with. And as we were looking at Richmond, you know, struck us as very important and interesting. So this is Gilpin and, and Jackson Ward, where I-95 is running right through the middle here. And you can see that I think consistent with the history of this area that you all will be much more familiar with than me, there are enormous differences to the north of I-95 in terms of kids' chances of of uh, rising up relative to the south of I-95, where you're seeing you know, dramatically higher rates of economic mobility, kids growing up in low-income families, earning almost twice as much or 50% more when they grow up as the kids were growing up in places like Gilpin, uh, just north of the highway that bisected that area in the 1950s, okay? So more broadly, you know, there's a lot more that you can learn from this map that's just one example about the drivers of economic mobility uh, and, and you know what, what really differs across neighborhoods in specific places. And I invite you all to look at the data in, in more detail for Richmond with your own perspective. What I wanna do is take these data and try to understand what is it that's leading to very sharp differences in rates of economic mobility 
in one part of Richmond relative to another part of Richmond, you know, north of I-95 versus south of I-95 in Jackson Ward, uh, and so forth. And so I'm gonna start by thinking about historical factors that seem uh, quite important. Uh, turning to this map, pair of maps here, where the map on the left actually comes from some very nice work done by the Digital Scholarship Lab right here in the University of Richmond, which I suspect some of you might have seen. It's a map of redlining uh, here in, in Richmond, where you might know that back in the 1930s, the federal government classified areas as being more or less credit worthy. And that ended up determining the amount of loans that people got and home ownership rates and lots of things downstream. And they basically used race, among other factors, to classify these areas. And you can see the areas shaded in pink there were what they gave a D rating, a hazardous rating, where it was basically impossible to get financing uh, moving forward after, after getting that rating. And what I want to show is juxtapose that redlining map from the 1930s with the map of upward mobility in the current day from the Opportunity Atlas that I was just showing you. And what you can see is there's actually a striking similarity between those two things. The places that were redlined, you know, given the red colors, are exactly, you know, very closely aligned with the places that are in the red colors, you know, on kind of the east side of the city with this ray in the middle of higher opportunity places that emerges, which are exactly the places that were not redlined, that were given better credit ratings at that time. So this is an example in Richmond, and this has been established in other areas as well. These kinds of historical factors, which importantly are not like an accident, right? They're actually something that were deliberately put in place. They have a lasting impact, apparently, when you look at the data even today. Now, why is that? It's not that redlining is still relevant in its current form. You know, credit access is not literally determined by that map today, so it's not exactly that mechanism. What is actually going on, I think, is that these kinds of historical factors, and I'm highlighting redlining, there, there are lots of other things that matter as well, these kinds of things end up affecting how communities develop in systematic ways that then affect outcomes in the present day. And so to, to get at that, we've looked at a variety of different factors, contemporaneous factors now, present day conditions, that might predict these differences in economic mobility across areas. And you know, in the interest of time, I'm just gonna highlight what we find as the strongest predictors of differences in economic mobility across places in the current day. And they're shown in this slide here. First, places that have higher levels of upward mobility tend to have lower poverty rates. They tend to be more mixed income communities rather than high concentrated poverty areas. Second, they tend to be places with more stable family structures, more two-parent families in particular. Third, they tend to be places with better schools, both K through 12 schools and access to higher education, which I'll come back to in more detail in a second. And finally, they tend to be places with greater social capital. So this idea of social capital, I wanna spend a minute on it. It's actually what our most recent work focuses on. People have talked about the idea that community and social capital and connections might matter for a long time. But in my view, we've never really had the data or the precision to be clear about what we mean by social capital and how exactly we might change it going forward. So in some recent work, uh, we decided to dig in more into what social capital actually means in a large scale collaboration with Facebook, uh, Meta, uh, using the Facebook platform to look at how people were connecting with each other in different communities. And we look at a bunch of different measures of social capital, but I'm gonna highlight one that really seems quite important in uh, driving these differences in economic mobility, which is a measure that we call economic connectedness. So in this map here, we're using data from Facebook, and we're asking if you are a relatively low-income person on Facebook, you have below median socioeconomic status, what fraction of your friends are high income. So this is just a measure of cross-class interaction. How connected are low-income people to high-income people? The blue-green colors here are places with more cross-class interaction, and in the red-colored places, the poor are more disconnected from higher-income folks. And what you can see here is um, there's, again, a lot of variation across the U.S. in terms of rates of economic connection. That scale's a bit cut off on the right, but you can see in uh, the red colored places, 
fewer than 29% of your friends are high income. In the blue-green colored places, half of your friends are, are high income. Richmond ranks relatively low in that distribution on average with about 36% of friends being, being high income. Now, when you look at this map, you might recognize visually it looks very similar uh, to the maps of economic mobility that I was showing you at the very beginning, right? It's the same kind of geographic pattern with the southeast having more disconnection and so forth. And if you just plot the two data sets against each other, so exactly like that first job growth plot that I showed you where we did not see much of a correlation, here we see an incredibly strong correlation. We're plotting the upward mobility data, the same upward mobility data on the vertical axis, now, instead of job growth on the horizontal axis, we're putting this measure of economic connection, cross-class interaction from the Facebook data, and you can see how well those two measures are related. There's an incredibly strong relationship in places where low-income people are more connected to high-income people. They have much better chances of escaping poverty. Now, the same thing plays out at the ground level here within Richmond. So let's go back to that example that I was highlighting in the Opportunity Atlas data and plot now this measure of economic connectedness, how many high-income friends do low-income folks have, and you can see exactly that kind of divide. This is now at the zip code level rather than the census tract level, so it's a little bit zoomed out, but exactly that same sort of divide where north of I-95 in places like Gilpin, there's a tremendous amount of disconnection between low- and high-income folks, but then a bit further south, uh, you have more cross-class interaction, exactly lining up with this idea that uh, the higher mobility places tend to be places where you have these kinds of interactions across class lines. Now, I'm focusing on the example of the highway, which was put in place in the 1950s, and I think is well known to have really disconnected these communities, and uh, these data suggest that that actually is quite important, consistent with this quote from uh, Pete Buttigieg, who, who uh, you know, remarked upon that, that pattern. So one driver, of a lack of interaction across class lines is just a lack of exposure, creating these divisions across different groups of people. So just to make that a bit more concrete, um, when we think about what determines interaction across class lines, and that's very important in trying to figure out how we might fix things going forward, you know, one factor that's very important is just how exposed low and high income people are to each other. So take the example, let's say, of two schools where all the high-income kids go to one school and all the low-income kids go to another school. Since you can only interact with people you actually meet, that's going to be an environment with a lot of disconnectedness, very similar to how the highway broke Richmond apart. But that's not the only factor that matters for interaction. You can also have a situation like this where I'm coloring the high-income kids in this example in green and the low-income kids in orange, you can have a situation where the schools or the neighborhoods are perfectly integrated, but still you have a lot of cross-class disconnection because the high-income friends are the high-income kids are friends with each other, and the low-income friends are kids are friends with each other. So even conditional on exposure, you might have a lack of interaction, and we call that friending bias. That is, even conditional on exposure, there's a bias in terms of who people are making friends with, and it's equally possible that this latter phenomenon is at play as well. Now, why is it important to distinguish these two things? If it's about a lack of exposure, then you want to figure out how you better integrate neighborhoods and better integrate schools to create more of those connections. But if it's about friending bias, just increasing integration is not gonna do anything. You have to figure out why there's a lack of interaction within these communities. So in our most recent work, we quantify the relative importance of these two factors, and it turns out the answer is it's 50-50. Both of them are equally important in explaining the social disconnection in America in general and in Richmond in particular. So that's important because it says that even if we somehow manage to integrate every neighborhood, we take down that highway and integrate places and so on, that would still only solve half of the social disconnection problem. We need to understand why we have this friending bias at play. And just to make concrete, you know, what I mean by that friending bias, I think this quote from Carmelo Anthony's recent memoir really captures well um, what, what, what the issue is. He talks about his experience growing up in Baltimore where the projects were on one side of the street, high income people lived on the other side of the street. So in some sense, it was an integrated place. But despite that, those two worlds would never cross, never make friends, never acknowledge each other. 
And so I think it's about more than just physically bringing people together. We have to think about how to actually foster those interactions going forward. And so let me make one final point on this before moving on to, to implications for, for policy and wrapping up. So exposure is something that we have tried through policy to change for many years, zoning laws, affordable housing, busing policies, and so forth. My view is that friending bias, this new notion that I'm talking about here, is also determined by institutional choices that we make. And one way you can see that is that the level of friending bias varies systematically across where people are making friends. So we see that the connections that people form within their neighborhoods or within their colleges tend to explain, exhibit a lot of friending bias. Low and high income people tend to separate from each other in those places. But if you look at the same set of people, and the types of friends they make in their churches or in their sports clubs and so forth, you see a lot more interaction across class lines, which indicates that this is not something that never changes. Actually, the way people interact with each other varies depending upon the institutional context. Another example of that is if we look across schools and look at where we see higher versus lower levels of friending bias, it turns out a very important determinant is the size of the school. In big schools and in big groups in general, people tend to come apart. In small groups, you see a lot more cross-class interaction. Again, a potential simple implication for policy. Think about how we might design smaller schools or smaller groups within schools that are diverse to foster this kind of interaction. Okay, so I've shown you a bunch of different results on what seems to matter in driving economic mobility. In the last few minutes here, I want to talk about how you all could take this research base and use it to actually change things on the ground to increase economic mobility uh, going forward. And I want to focus on three different approaches that we are concentrating our efforts on uh, in our Opportunity Insights group, um, which are reducing segregation, making place-based investments, and finally improving higher education. Why focus on these three areas? I think if you take in a nutshell, you know, what I've shown you, like what's the one line summary, it's that the roots of economic opportunity in America are hyper local. It's about the particular environment in which you're growing up. And there are a wide variety of environmental factors that matter that affect childhood development over the course of, of kids' lives from birth to something like when they enter the labor market, when they're in their early 20s who they're exposed to, who they're connecting with, the quality of their schools, this is what ends up really driving economic mobility. If you have that view of the world, I think you'd naturally think about these three different lines of attack. Can you help people move to higher opportunity areas, so reduce segregation? Can you bring opportunity to places that are currently low opportunity, to the red colored parts of the map? Or after age 18, when most kids have left their home, can you amplify the impacts of local institutions of higher education on economic mobility. So let me spend a, a couple of minutes on each of these and then conclude and we'll open it up to, to questions and, and discussion. So let me start by talking about the reducing segregation approach. And here I'm gonna give you an uh, example from Seattle uh, where our team has been doing some work where here's again a snapshot from the Opportunity Atlas. You see that familiar pattern of lots of variation across nearby neighborhoods and kids' chance of rising up in Seattle. What we've done here is overlaid in the bright green dots the most common census tracts where people receiving housing vouchers from the federal government currently live. As you all know, we spend a tremendous amount of money in the US, about $45 billion per year, on affordable housing pro uh, programs, the largest component of which are these housing vouchers, which give families in the Seattle area something like $1,500 a month of rental assistance to rent housing wherever they would like, presumably with the goal of giving them access to better opportunities in better neighborhoods that might break the cycle of poverty. But if you look at these data, you can see that the green dots are actually clustered in the red and orange colored parts of Seattle, rather than the blue-green colored parts of Seattle, where we know the cycle of poverty is much more likely to be broken. So despite the fact that people are getting these housing vouchers, they're not actually using them to move to neighborhoods that are gonna improve their kids' outcomes. And you see that pattern in Seattle, see that pattern in cities across America. So we wondered, you know, why is that the case? And can we do something about that? And so we teamed up with the Seattle and King County Housing Authorities to run a randomized pilot to help families with housing vouchers move to higher opportunity neighborhoods if they wanted to do so. And what was that program? We basically gave families some assistance 
to try to eliminate the barriers that they might face in moving to higher opportunity places. So assistance in the housing search process, connecting them with landlords, a little bit of financial assistance to pay for things like application fees and security deposits. And we run, ran this as a randomized trial where 500 families got this additional assistance when they came in to apply for a housing voucher, and 500 families were in the control group and just got the voucher and the, didn't get this additional help. And so we can compare what happened in terms of where these families ended up choosing to live. And you can see that in the control group that didn't get the additional assistance, consistent with the map that I was just showing you, only 14% of families ended up moving to high opportunity places. In the treatment group, that number jumps up to 55%. The majority of families are now growing up in these high opportunity, their kids are growing up in these high opportunity areas. And just to kind of show you that on a map, the blue shaded area in this map is what we designate as the high opportunity parts of Seattle based on our Opportunity Atlas data. The green pins show you where families in the treatment group ended up moving. The red pins show you where families in the control group end up moving. And you can see that we basically started to desegregate the city where these lower income families are now using the housing vouchers to move to neighborhoods where we estimate their kids are gonna grow up to earn about $200,000 more over their lifetimes relative to if they, they had you know, been unlucky and been in one of these red pin areas. So that is one you know, clearly actionable approach that I think will make a significant difference in terms of rates of upward mobility for kids in Seattle. And just to show you how this kind of work can scale, uh, since we did that work in Seattle, HUD then decided to take that up and replicate the Seattle demonstration, uh, putting in about $80 million to redo that in nine other cities across America. That's currently happening. And there's now a bill working its way through Congress to expand the housing voucher program by about $5 billion per year and provide these sorts of supports to more families you know, across the United States, which could change the lives of thousands of kids uh, going forward. So that's one concrete example of something we can do to take an existing program on, on which we're already spending a ton of money and tweak it, if you will, to make it more effective using these kinds of data. Now, you, you may be thinking, and I, I certainly recognize, that the moving to opportunity approach is a small piece of the puzzle here. You can't possibly move everyone. Not everyone wants to move. So the more important and I think scalable solution going forward is to figure out how you bring opportunity to people where they're currently living rather than moving them to different neighborhoods. And so that brings me to the place-based investment approach. And so to talk about the work that one can do there, I wanna go back to Charlotte, which I've highlighted a couple of times. When we put out our uh, study a few years ago showing that Charlotte ranked very low in terms of rates of upward mobility, the local media and local community reacted by saying, you know, this is really a wake up call. How can we think of ourselves as such an opportunity rich community, yet be ranked as one of the lowest upward mobility places where kids growing up in low income families don't have great chances of rising up. And one of the things that happened, and this might be, you know, kind of a model for the type of work that could be done in Richmond, local actors came together from the CEO of Bank of America to uh, local chamber of commerce to people in the government, the housing authorities and so forth, put their heads together to, to, in a task force to devise a set of changes that they could each make to increase economic mobility. I'll give you one example. Bank of America, recognizing that people in the local community were not getting the great jobs that they were offering, made a commitment to hire a thousand people from disadvantaged communities within Charlotte. Now they recognized that there was, you, could, you couldn't just make that commitment kind of in a vacuum, you had to have people who actually had the skills needed to get these jobs. And so they teamed up with a group called Year Up, which is a sectoral job training program that has a one-year program where they basically equip people with the skills needed to get a job at a particular company and also provide mentoring and various other kinds of assistance uh, to, to create these pathways. And just to show you how effective this can be, Here's uh, an analysis we've done of the Year Up program in other contexts, where again, it's run as an experiment. People in the blue-green here get access to the Year Up program in year zero. People in the orange don't, and we're just looking at their earnings over time. And you can see that once you participate in the Year Up program, your life completely changes in terms of your earnings trajectory. You end up earning about 35% more on average as you get these higher paying jobs and keep them 
in the years to come. And so, you know, that is an illustration, I think, of a very concrete place-based approach that has been taken in Charlotte and I think could be expanded elsewhere in partnership with, with programs like Europe that, that can really make a difference. I want to spend a minute wrapping up here by touching on higher uh, education. So I've focused on data across neighborhoods and what we can do in communities at that level. But we've also constructed statistics on economic mobility in a similar way for every college in America. And so you can look up in a nice tool the New York Times has created, you know, any college that you're interested in. Here, every dot represents a different college in America, and we've highlighted some of the colleges in the local area here. And you can look up two key statistics that, that determine how much a college contributes to economic mobility. So on the vertical axis here is what we call the upward mobility rate. It's saying for the kids who start out in low-income families who are attending a given college, what fraction of them start out in the bottom 20% and end up reaching the top 20%. And so to pick an example, I'll take my own institution, Harvard. Harvard looks terrific on that dimension. Low-income kids who attend Harvard, they do great, you know, some of the best outcomes on average in terms of earnings, chances of reaching the upper middle class and beyond uh, in the U.S. But that's not the only dimension that matters, of course. What, what matters for your total contribution to economic mobility is not just how well low-income kids do, but how many low-income kids you have to begin with on campus. And that's what's shown on the horizontal axis, what fraction of the kids in your student body are coming from the bottom 20%. And on that dimension, Harvard looks terrible. Very few kids come from low-income families. And so obviously, places like Harvard and Yale and Princeton and so on cannot be contributing a whole lot to economic mobility in the US because there are just hardly any low-income kids on campus to begin with. So if you think about this chart, you know, you kind of need to be in the upper right side in order to be contributing a lot to economic mobility. You need to enroll a lot of low-income kids and deliver pretty good outcomes. And you can see that unfortunately in the US, we have a pattern where most of the data is not in that upper right side. You either have a bunch of colleges that have very good outcomes, but very limited access for low-income kids, or you have many community colleges that are serving many low-income kids, but the outcomes don't look that great. There are some exceptions. So take a place like the City University of New York. Outcomes are pretty good. They enroll lots of low-income kids. And so it, lots of kids at, at CUNY are moving from the bottom to the top. But that's generally the exception. And you can look at the data here within Richmond, where you see, for instance, University of Richmond, UVA, have very good outcomes relative to the typical college in the US. But fitting that pattern that I was just describing, enroll very few low-income low kids. So I think figuring out how to move those dots to the right and move the dots like the local community colleges up, those are key areas of focus going forward. All right, so final point, and I'm recognizing we're, we're uh, uh, over on time here. Um, I just want to make the case that for the business community, you know, here in the audience and, and others who, you know, are not from low-income families themselves, like, why should you care about these issues beyond just being charitable and trying to be a good citizen? I actually think there's a really big stake for local businesses themselves in getting this right. And so to, to illustrate that, I want to turn to this final analysis that I'll show you, which comes from linking data on the universe of patent holders in the U.S., so inventors, to tax record information on parental income. And what you see in this chart here is we're looking at your chance of becoming an inventor versus your parents' income. And you can see that if you happen to be born to parents in the top 1% of the income distribution, you're about 10 times as likely to become an inventor as if you happen to be born to lower income parents. Now, why do I highlight this particular channel? A lot of what I've been focused on is how increasing opportunity can help kids themselves rise up and do better for themselves. But as this analysis illustrates, when they do better, if they're inventing new things, starting new companies and so on, that benefits not just them, but it also benefits the companies they work for and it benefits society more broadly. And so building on this sort of analysis, what we show in this paper is that there are a number of groups in America that are being basically left out of the innovation and economic development process. We estimate that if women, minorities, kids from underrepresented minority backgrounds and kids from lower income families were to invent things at the same rate as high income white men, you'd have four times as many inventors in America. 
In that sense, there are a lot of lost Einsteins, a lot of lost potential that's not coming through the pipeline because of the set of issues that I've highlighted here. And so my view is addressing those issues is important not just to create better opportunities for low-income kids, but to increase economic growth and improve companies' outcomes uh, you know, for, for everyone. So let me end uh, with this slide here. So you know, what are some takeaways in terms of how we can actually restore the American dream going forward? And what can we do from a business perspective, from a local community perspective? First, I think as I've shown you, recruiting talent from diverse groups in par partnership with proven sectoral job training programs like Europe can be incredibly effective. That's something businesses can literally do like Bank of America did in Charlotte. Second, I think investing in socially disconnected communities. Think of the I-95 example I was giving you that historically have lower rates of upward mobility can be incredibly valuable. Third, supporting policy reforms that will increase economic mobility and ultimately expand the talent pool for business, I think is, is uh, an important thing to do. And then finally, at a kind of a bigger picture level, you know, it's now common in the private sector to use data to systematically measure progress in your own companies. As I hope I've illustrated here, that same kind of hard-nosed approach can be really valuable in thinking about economic mobility. And I hope some of those tools will be useful to all of you uh, as you do this important work. So thanks so much, and I look forward to your questions. Raj, thank you so much for that. You might want your water. So we want to provide an opportunity for you all to ask some questions. We're going to have time here with, with Mickey and with Raj. But if you go to the website, menti.com, and enter the code that you see on the screen, you can ask some questions. And we're going to flow those into our Q&A right now. All right? So go to menti.com and enter the code to ask your questions. Great. And hand it over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Tess, can you hear me all right? Yeah. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for being here. I really appreciate it. Um, I want to first start out by saying, I don't know if people know this, but you have been a very uh, strong proponent of increasing access to econ education to a lot of uh, students from a wide variety of backgrounds. Our faculty in the economics department use your materials that you graciously put out for others to use uh, very widely. So thank you for doing that. Really, really uh, appreciate it. Fascinating work. Congratulations on all of this. This is really, really good. Um, you really hit one of the key issues here. You showed that 90, Highway 95 cutting off Jackson Ward, Gilpin Court. That was a very intentional act. And, and as you mentioned, a lot of what we see is a result of intentional acts that were taken. How do you think about that historical context and how does that get taken into account when we think about policy uh, solutions and implications? Does that make a difference in whether or not they're going to work or not? Yeah, that? well, th thanks so much for that, Mickey. So first, let me just say, you know, for us kind of sitting in our offices at Harvard, looking at these data and finding these patterns, it's always reassuring when you come with folks who actually know the neighborhoods to say, yeah, this actually resonates and connects with uh, things we, we talk about. And I think it shows you the importance of these phenomena where we're looking at it from like 30,000 foot view no kind of local understanding and seeing these patterns very clearly in the data. And it shows you how real and persistent these effects are. Now, to your question, mm -hmm. you know, I, I would answer that in two ways. So first, these deliberate acts that have happened historically, they clearly have persistent impacts. And so at one level, we can sort of blame history, but it also shows us that these things can be changed. And in the same way that deliberate choices were made before that might have made things worse, presumably we can make choices going forward that make things better. Now, I don't think it's as simple as if you take the highway example, you know, suppose we could demolish that highway and reconnect those communities. Do we expect outcomes to immediately kind of revert back to where they were before? I don't think it's that straightforward because of the various things that have happened since then because of that division that was created. So you create this higher poverty community where resources have now changed, schools have changed, people's expectations and norms have changed, uh, their aspirations have changed, and all that's not going to just be undone by literally changing that historical event. And so I think what we need to do is take this data, recognize the role that history has played, recognize what factors seem to be important now, and take deliberate actions in the same way that they were taken before, but on a variety of different dimensions, thinking about schools, thinking about social capital, and so on. 
as I was emphasizing. Yeah, because there's another context in there around tax base and mm -hmm. annexation rules and things like that that yeah. limit the number of policy options. Um, the other thing, you and I were talking backstage about, uh, I was telling you when I was a young assistant professor, I got to uh, be part of a panel interviewing Charles Murray, who wrote The Bell Curve. It strikes me, who took a slightly different approach to looking at differences. Uh, here is an environmental approach of the, play, the, the role of place. It strikes me when people think about policy choices and implications, it's almost like a Rorschach test in terms of what their beliefs yep. are about the causes yep. of these differences. What do you think about that? Tell me a little yeah, bit. Yeah, you know, when people look at these maps, some people react by saying, oh, you know, I really see the important role of schools. Other people say, I see the important role of family structure or social capital. In my view, and you know, people, as you noted, to have a tendency to gravitate towards maybe their own personal experience, their own yeah. beliefs, and so on. I don't necessarily see that as a problem in the sense that these are complicated, multifaceted issues that have many different factors that are playing into them. It's not only about poverty rates and the role of schools, it's about other things as well. And so, you know, if you come to the table wanting to focus on how we change the level of segregation or the quality of schools in an area, and someone else comes in wanting to focus on culture and social capital and so forth. My sense is there's a big tent where we can make progress on these issues from multiple different directions. And that's my hope in, in what these data will bring up. Thank you. I'm curious about these maps and somebody asked, I'm, I'm, I'm reading your questions here as we go along too. Uh, I was wondering whether the story would be the same in other countries. The rate of, uh, yeah. of progress from child to, from parent to child, and yeah. do you have place-based effects? Uh, what yeah. happens in other countries? Yeah, it's a great question. So as we started to do this work in the U.S., our team focuses mainly on the U.S., partly because that's where the data are the best, and there's only so many things you can do. But there are other research teams now replicating our work in many other countries, in Scandinavian countries where you have good data, and developing countries. And let me just give you a few highlights from what people are finding. So first, the U.S. is kind of unique, relatively unique in that dramatic fading of the American dream pattern that I showed. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a number of other countries where there's been some reduction, but much less. It goes from like 90 to 80 percent instead of 90 to 50 percent. Why? The reason is that the trends in terms of inequality in America are very distinct from other countries like Canada or many European countries where you continue to see an increase in wages at the low end of the income distribution in a way that you basically don't in the U.S. starting around 1980. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that, I think, is an important point of, of comparison to understand. When we get to these local neighborhood effects, in other places, places seem to matter as much as they do in the U.S. I think that's kind of a universal truth. There's maybe a little bit more variation in America than if you take an example like Sweden, which tends to have, to your point about property tax, finance schools. Many other countries, we have central financing of schools, and that creates a bit more equity than you see in the U.S., but still, you know, neighborhood context, the environment you're growing up in matters. I think that's not like a uniquely American thing. So I'm curious, so your research focuses on place-based effects. Um, you know, we, through the pandemic, we learned about, and I know there's differential access to internet, so I get that, so that's a, that's a, that's a boundary condition to this. But do you think as we have access to opportunities, educational opportunities, other people we can reach out to and other influences yeah. digitally, do you yeah. think the impact of place-based effects will yeah. fade over time? It's a great question. I mean, my instinct is, and you know, it, it connects very directly with what I presented on the Facebook data, yeah. right? Where we are using the Facebook data at present for basically a proxy for who people are actually interacting with in the real world. A natural question going forward is, if you have more and more online uh, interactions, does that allow you to maybe break down these boundaries? At one level, you think there could be a lot of potential because you're no longer bound by who's literally around you. You could connect with somebody who has similar interests, you know, in a totally different part of the country. But I think it's still very early stage, but research suggests that people tend to self-segregate a lot in online circles as well. So unless we make a deliberate effort to actually create those communities, I think you're going to see a tendency. If you just think about yourself, you know, who do you interact with online? Who's on those Zoom calls that you do and so forth? Yeah. It's not like you're having an incredible, I would guess, an incredibly diverse group of interactions. It's with people who you tend to know already and so on. Since you brought up the Facebook page, I mean, I'm sure a lot of people are wondering, just as I am, what goes on in that? Like, what, what is the mechanism by which friending a person of high SES, yeah. low SES, 
creates this effect. Yeah, thank you, think you, thank you for there? asking that. And I, I didn't go into that in much detail. So we think there are three mechanisms that seem that could be quite important. And this remains to be further fleshed out, but let me just lay them out. First, I think, uh, so just to summarize the fact first that we see in the data, growing up in a place where there's more interaction across class lines. So like if you move at an earlier age to a place where low and high income people are interacting more, the better you do in the long run. Okay, so why could that be? A first simple channel I think of as kind of information. If you think about something like applying to college or you know, what do I need to do to prepare to get into the University of Richmond and so on. If I'm around a set of people who have done that before, whose parents have done that, I may have information on how to do that, that, that changes what I do. A second explanation, which I actually think might be more important, is shaping people's aspirations. If I've never met somebody whose parents are doctors or who are working in tech or you know whatever the sector might be, uh, I think kids' mindsets and what they aspire to do becomes totally different. If the only person I've ever heard of who's been successful you know, became a pro basketball player, which is of course incredibly unlikely as a path to success, mm -hmm. it shapes your views, I think, in a very different way than if you've seen uh, lots of people succeed in, in a variety of different ways. And then the third mechanism is what you might think of with networks as just direct referrals. Most jobs in America are obtained through referrals. And if you're in a network where more people are connected with folks who are doing well, you're more likely to get that internship, to get the job that launches you on a good trajectory. So I think all of those could be important. Are you all testing that by looking at the content yeah. of what flows between friends within Facebook? Yeah, so we're trying to figure out ways now of distinguishing between those mechanisms, trying to understand how you might change those things going forward and so yeah. on. So somebody asked, and this is an important role. So the broader question here is what are the key, what's the size of the levers? Which is the key levers to go after? And you mentioned higher ed, obviously something that's important to both of us, we work in higher ed. Uh, but what role does earlier education play and how important are those relative yeah. to higher ed? So early education I think is incredibly important. So when I briefly highlighted the importance of school quality, there's a lot of work that's been done by other team and other research teams uh, where we can take data, for instance, on the type of kindergarten classroom that kids were in and show that 30 years later, when we look at their level of earnings, if you, you happen to have a better teacher in kindergarten than I did, you are earning more you're, uh, you know, you're more likely to go to college, you're less likely to have a teenage pregnancy, you're less likely to be incarcerated. So education at early ages matters. The one thing I would emphasize is sometimes when people focus on early education, they kind of view it as the earliest years matter and like later years don't matter as much. That's not what I think we see in the data. Early education matters a lot. So does education in middle school, so does education in high school, and so does higher ed. Interesting. Yeah, I think your research there was, was very popular because it showed that teachers were way underpaid. Those kindergarten yes. teachers have a high, high, cost, high return on high that return. investment, um, which we all know is true. Somebody asked about cost of living, and I was going to ask you about that. You talk about these opportunity bargains, right? Yeah. So, because so, the obvious thing is these high mobility areas probably have higher cost of yeah. living. Uh, but you did find some places yeah. where you have lower cost of living and high mobility, these bargains. Um, so how do you, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, that's right. That? That's right, Mickey. So, you, you know, you might wonder, I showed you a bunch of neighborhoods where kids do better. They tend to be more expensive places. That's definitely true. And it just makes sense intuitively, right? Like if, if you parents recognize that certain schools seem like better schools, prices are going to get bid up in those areas. They maybe become unaffordable to low income families. But here I want to go back to the Seattle example. And that's what I think is so important there, where you're looking at a set of low income families. They're getting these vouchers from the government. And what we were able to demonstrate is that they are actually able to move to places. They can perfectly well afford places where their kids will do dramatically better. And it's because there are what we call these opportunity bargain areas. You don't have to move to Bellevue, you know, the place where Bill Gates lives in, in <laughs> Seattle, in order for your kids to, to have great outcomes. You can move to a place called Shoreline on the north side of Seattle or other communities that are a bit more expensive than maybe where you were before, but certainly affordable. Uh, and so the point is, there's a lot of variation in, in these neighborhoods that's not just about living in like the fanciest place. Now the reality is, can you use a voucher in Bellevue? So that's another issue is how yeah. many opportunities are there to use work. 
what is yes. the restrictions for using that voucher? So the NIMBYism and everything yes. else that goes along with that. Yeah. Is that. And I mean, just to share an encouraging note on that front, Mickey, I, you know, we, what we found in Seattle, we were very worried about that. The landlords, is the issue that the people are not able to move there or is it that the landlords don't want them to, to want to take housing voucher folks? And so what we found is if you work with landlords and try to simplify the inspection process, get rid of some of the red tape, actually make it easier to work with tenants, mm -hmm. To our surprise, after the pilot ended, the, the Seattle Housing Authority reports that they actually have landlords reaching out to them mm -hmm. to try to get more tenants because they're so happy with how the program's working. So it's quite the contrary of, you know, our worry was once we stop doing this, it's all going to fall apart. I actually don't think that's the case. So that's really interesting. Some of the questions here were about the specifics of that Seattle program. So I think you just highlighted something that wasn't as clear as how when you worked with these landlords and try to yeah. change misconceptions and yeah. some of the uh, barriers uh, to that. Now, some of your research on, on movement um, from low opportunity to high opportunity, I was curious about the opposite. Somebody who moves from high opportunity to low opportunity, what happens then? Yeah, so just as a bit of background, and I didn't spend much time on this, I showed you all these maps. We've done a bunch of studies of kids who move, as Mickey's asking, from lower opportunity to higher opportunity places or the other way around. So take a set of kids who start out in like the red colored parts of Richmond and imagine their family moves to a blue colored part. What ends up happening to their kids? And what we establish is a very systematic result that the earlier you move to one of these higher opportunity neighborhoods, the better your kids do in the long run. So to make a medical analogy, it looks like there's a dosage effect. Every extra year you spend, up, spend growing up in a high opportunity area, the better you do. Now you're asking, you know, suppose you think about the opposite move where you started out in a blue colored part, green colored part, and you move to the red orange colored neighborhoods, what ends up happening to your outcomes? And remarkably, it's totally symmetric. It's basically like every extra year you end up spending in the lower opportunity area. Unfortunately, the worse your outcomes look in the long run, the less likely you are to go to college, the lower your earnings are, the higher the rate of incarceration, and so on. So I just think of it, Mickey, as basically like, it's an average of the set of places and environments in which you grew up, and you just kind of add that all up. That's what really seems to matter. And the other thing you, um, your research shows that when you do move, you don't quite catch up. Like there's a kind of a residual effect that yeah. you're carrying with you. And that's right. You know, I, I don't want to overstate. We think place and environment matters. Uh, and sometimes people ask me, are you saying family doesn't matter or like the, the background that you're from is totally irrelevant? And I'm not saying that. You know, clearly other factors matter as well. The point is just that environment does matter and environment is something that we can actually change uh, and, and can really make a difference. What role, somebody was asking about rural, urban, what role does population yeah. density play? Yeah. Uh, you know, interactions are different. We're just in New York last week. I mean, we can't yeah. help but to bump into different kinds of people, literally. Yeah. Mm. I mean, actually, you know, maybe surprisingly contrary to that example, you may have noticed in some of the maps that I was showing you that it was the dense urban cores of cities that often had the lower levels of upward mobility. Interesting. And to me, this comes back to the friending bias point that I was making, mm -hmm. that it's not just about bumping into someone on the street or sitting in the same cafeteria or going to the same restaurant in New York. It's about whether you actually interact with those folks. And I think in a place like New York City, it's a great example of where, if you think about the school system in New York, it's so stratified by class where higher income folks have basically exited the public school system entirely. Mm -hmm. It's not just about physically being in the same place. That example illustrates that it's about how you actually connect uh, with people. You know, so obviously moving people, it's either unscalable, unrealistic, and people have social ties yeah. and family ties to place. So the, you talk about making place-based investments. Uh, I have a couple of questions on that. One is, you know, that, brings up the issue of gentrification. Is this a, a topic that yeah. you all have looked at and what are your yeah. thoughts on that? Yeah, so gentrification is something we're very worried about in terms of, you know, when you make a place-based investment, does it actually stick and help the people who you intended to help to begin with or does it just gentrify the places now better and lower income folks are forced, forced to move to some other place yeah. where they lack opportunity once again. So. I don't have a great answer, empirical answer to that question. I'm going to share an, uh, a conversation I had with Jeff Canada, the founder of the Harlem Children's Zone, an incredibly successful effort to revitalize Harlem, which I thought was really telling. You know, Jeff said, uh, I, I have one regret 
which is that we didn't purchase more affordable, ho more housing, make an investment in housing to begin with in Harlem before we started this program, because in some ways we're victims of our own success. Harlem Children's Zone was so successful that Harlem is now an actually an attractive place to live. And a lot of the people I set out to help are not the people I'm able to help now. So what, what I would suggest is when we take a place-based approach, we don't forget the housing part of it, the affordable housing part of it. We actually are deliberate ex ante to make sure we're able to, to support uh, folks living in those neighborhoods as they become more attractive. And I'm sure that's music to the ears of Greta Harris and others in the affordable housing space here in town, um, that we need to look, be intentional ahead of time yeah. before the property values yeah. get so that people then look at the cost uh, of that. The other thing I wanted to ask you about making place-based investments is what does the research show? What are, is there evidence that making those investments actually does yeah. increase mobility? Yeah, so now I think you've basically come to the frontier of where the research okay. is, um, where there are certain programs, like I was focusing on the Year Up program, which can be targeted in a place-based way and I think has really proven effects. There are certainly changes we can make in schools. There are certain types of charter schools that are very effective. There are other types of charter schools that are much less effective. Um, but what we haven't seen yet, and we don't yet have the data on our large-scale efforts to revitalize places. A very good example would be the HOPE 6 program, mm. uh, where the uh, federal government invested a tremendous amount of money to basically turn high poverty public housing projects into mixed income areas. And we are currently undertaking a, a large project to evaluate with these kinds of data, you know, do we actually see kids' outcomes improving in those places? And if so, where and why? Don't have the answer yet. I mean, that's, I think, exactly the frontier where we hope to have something to say in, in the years to come. Well, maybe Richmond can be a leader in that. I heard the other day, I think there's some thoughts about that in terms of Gilpin Court and, and Jackson Ward. And there's a lot of people working really hard to, to do that um, here. Somebody was asking about the percentage of people from low-income families who want to move. And yeah. that brings up the broader issue of causality in your study, right? Yeah. Because the wanting to move suggests yeah. there may be some other... Yes, of that, great, so. great question. Yeah. So um, say two things there. So on the wanting to move, let's go back to the Seattle data. That was kind of the point of the Seattle uh, experiment. We wanted to understand whether families might have other good reasons for not wanting to move to high opportunity places because it might be closer to their families, closer to their jobs. There could be many good reasons you don't want to move to the other side of the lake in Seattle. And so the purpose, the way we set up the study was we weren't forcing anyone to move anywhere. We just said, look, we're going to support you in making these moves. You choose where you want to move. But, you know, if you're finding it hard to find housing in this neighborhood that you want to move to, we'll, we'll support you in doing that. And what you could see is that assistance dramatically changed where families chose to move, mm -hmm. which shows that many families do, in fact, have a preference. And you see this in qualitative work we did after we're talking with these families, they wanted to move to these places and they actually were not even surprised to know their kids would do much better in those so places. They were holding but, willingness constant there. Exactly, but, yeah. but they uh, were not able to get there yeah. because you know when you have two jobs and are dealing with so many other challenges, the last thing you have time for is to figure out this complicated process of finding housing in a different unfamiliar place. Now, that said, you know the families who manage to move absent our support are different from the families that don't move. Okay. And that gets to your question of causality. You know, is it really the causal effect of the place or is it that the families who are moving are, are different? Let me give you one piece of evidence that speaks to that above and beyond the experiment. Let's say you take a family with siblings, with two kids, and this is what I find one of the most striking pieces of, of the data. Let's say I move to a higher opportunity place with a three-year-old and a seven-year-old. What you see remarkably is that the three-year-old has better outcomes than the seven-year-old exactly in proportion to that four-year age gap. So there you're holding the family constant and you're seeing these differences emerge for the kids depending upon how long they were exposed to these different environments, which I think really shows you the, the power of environmental factors. You know, we all learned it in polite conversations, you don't want to bring up politics, but somebody did ask that those maps have a remarkable yeah tie in with perhaps political? I mean, is there, have y'all have y'all looked at policy yeah. uh, implications or policy drivers of yeah. how those maps are? Yeah, so on politics, I actually think you don't, and there are other people who have taken our data and done these analyses, you don't find much of a correlation with politics on the whole. And let me okay. give you an example that illustrates that. So the um, rural Midwest, 
has some of the highest rates of upward mobility, states like North Dakota uh, and uh, you know, parts of Iowa and so on. Um, many of Colorado, et cetera, the, a lot of those places are right-leaning and they tend to have some of the highest rates of upward mobility. But then you have lot of, you know, places like San Francisco and parts of the coast that also have very high rates of upward mobility that tend to be more left-leaning. And so on net, it turns out if you put, say, the share of people who voted for a Republican or Democrat on those graphs that I was showing you as a predictor, it's actually not that correlated on the whole. And it goes back to one of the early questions you asked, Mickey, which is, this is a multifaceted problem. It's not just about the people on the left have the solution, the people on the right have the solution. I actually think there are multiple things at play here, and it's a way to make progress in a, in a polarized time. Well, that's really, I think, optimistic and encouraging, so I, I appreciate that very much. You know, I think one of the barriers in this kind of discussion and looking at policy solutions is I find that there's a fixed pie mentality that people grab onto. So when you think about investments, they look at, well, what about me yeah. or whatever? Have you thought about that? Yeah. Do you see that as a barrier to doing Yeah, things? yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, this is why I, I took a few extra minutes and I really wanted to show those slides at the end on the patents and the data showing how when some kids do better, you shouldn't think of it as a zero-sum game where you've taken the spot that I now would have had. Rather, when folks do better, I think many of them are doing things that benefit lots of people. And moreover, you know, to look at it maybe from a cynical economist perspective, when folks do better, they're also less reliant on things like transfer payments, and we're spending less money on incarceration, and there's so many other things where society saves money, even if you just want to look at it from like that narrow uh, dollars and cents perspective. And so I absolutely don't think this is a zero-sum game. It's, it's far from that. Of course, the hard part, and as always, is hard to account for an unspent dollar in the future, right? So people don't don't, don't see oh, that. I think that's the challenge we need to yeah. overcome. I'm curious about your map, and we talked about this a little bit, and I know you don't have this data, but I, 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 I was curious what you would think about if you were to able to, if you were able to see your map over time, what, yeah. is, what, what, is, the, what is the time effect? Are we getting, yeah. is the whole country getting redder? Is it getting yeah. bluer? Is, yeah. are, are you seeing that bifurcation of yeah. different parts of the country? Yeah, another, another great question, another question kind of at the frontier of where the research is. The, the simple answer is we don't know the answer to your question yet because we don't have that data historically. It's been challenging enough to compile on all this data for recent years from tax records. We're now working on a large-scale project to digitize information from tapes and do this going back to the 1940s where we'll be able to basically think of like a video where you can see the map yeah. changing over the decades in America. And I'm, I'm really curious to see what that looks like. Some early indications from more limited data sources show you that over the, the horizon of decades, this is definitely not fixed. There were parts of the Midwest that provided much better opportunities for African Americans, for example, a, a while back. And then over time, after the great migration of Black Americans from the South to the North, many of those cities began to disinvest in things like public goods and schools and so on and started to become lower opportunity places. So it goes back to the point that these are not fixed things, even if historical factors played a role, they have changed and they can change going forward. No, I agree, and I think to me that's a takeaway, and I saw Todd, so I think we need to wrap up, but uh, that intentional acts led to where we are, intentional acts I think can get us to a different place. As I, I, one of my favorite books that I read recently is called The Dawn of Everything, mm -hmm. where they, I don't know if you're familiar with that book, where they basically were looking at this issue of inequality, mm -hmm. and the common argument is that it's just an inevitable progression of, cult, of society. Mm -hmm. As we progress, you're gonna have natural inequality as we stratify. They argue, no, that's not the case. These were intentional choices that societies make in how mm -hmm. they wanna structure themselves. So I think the research shows ways in which we can do that. So thank you very much for these insights. and. Again, welcome to Richmond and hope we have you back here where we can see all the success that we were able to have around eight places like Jackson Ward and Gilpin Court. So thanks thank so much to you and thank you everyone for your interest.